get it. Um, but still, 70% has always been a key number from what I've heard. I'm not an immunologist, but in terms of uh, herd immunity and that whole thing, the fact that we'll get 70% who are willing to take it early is going to be an important thing for kind of all of us in terms, again, in terms of consumer sentiment related to safety for travel. The one thing that was a negative with this wave is they feel less safe than they did a month ago. And that generally, every time we've seen cases go up, safe, people feeling safe goes down. Because again, we still have some few groups, but those people in the middle who are kind of like, I don't know if I should travel, as these cases go up, they are gonna be more likely to stay at home. Um, what do they feel safe doing? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff on here. I just wanted to put this on there to remind you folks that the beach is still the number one thing that people feel safe doing. So it, it, it's part of the commodity that you have here. People, as you can see, with staying in hotels, that has just gone up and up and up. And, and that's one of the things that we've seen as people have started to do some travel, once they take a flight, once they stay at a hotel, once they stay at a vacation rental, what have you, okay, they got over that, that initial fear and they're generally a little bit more willing to, again, to do it again. Um, where do they want to go on their first trip or you know once they feel once they're it's ready to travel where, where, do, where do they want to do they still want to go to beach destinations the one thing that i want to point out on here is this willingness to fly versus preference to drive willingness to fly was in front of drive for the first time since april and again as, as tam said people are more and more willing to fly and we'll, we'll see that throughout um, which would be good news for getting folks from the midwest and the northeast etc where would you consider going uh, the Southwest Florida beaches came in number one again, but as, as we saw, as, as it's gotten a little bit colder, preference to come down here has gone up a little bit. And as we compare uh, Fort, Fort Myers Sanibel Captiva to your neighbors to the north and the south, you'll see um, Fort Myers Sanibel Captiva is a place, again, as we're looking, as, as it gets colder up there, preference to come down here has, 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 has increased. Um, for planning vacations, Again, a lot of data here. There isn't as much travel um, planned already in the first month, in the next two months. The one thing I want to notice down here on the bottom right, this is the first time since May that you had a greater percentage of people without vacations planned. So again, it's a strain, as cases have went up, planning it has went down. That doesn't mean they don't want to be inspired. That doesn't mean they're not ready. It just means they're less, they're just not as, they're not as prone to plan it. Um, in terms of messaging, um, safety every time we've done this has been th at the top of what they want to hear. However, as we see this routine destination specific ads, and I don't want to call it routine for what you folks do, but just getting back to the normal ads that you're used to doing, people are becoming more and more responsive to that type of message. Not everybody, safety still first, but it's just good to see them ready to go in that direction. In terms of planning, again, uh, this is a ton of data, so I'm not gonna go through every little thing. This is one thing I've wanted to notice. Every time we do a question like this, a, a Google search is always at, the, at number one, but destination websites are still a big part of that planning process. And it always is a big part, but during the pandemic, it's been a bigger part of the planning process. Now, interestingly, I mentioned people feel less safe. They have less vacations planned because of the rise in cases. That said, this upward progression of people who have traveled in the last month continues to go up. Now granted, I think Thanksgiving had a little bit of a part of that uptick in actual travel. At the same time, even, even, even the, the fact that people feel a little less safe, more and more people are still traveling. So it's, people are an interesting thing, but, you know, but they are, there are people out there. And why do they want to do it? Relax and wine, and I think what, what Tony just mentioned earlier, they just want to get out of the dang house. And they want, they want to go look at four different walls and a beach as opposed to the four walls they've been seeing for a long time. And this is, I mean, this is especially important to consider. In Florida, we've been a lot more open for a long time. When, if you're talking to someone, I have friends in Minneapolis, friends in New York City, they're just living in a different reality than we are. And this vacation is a, is a bigger getaway, a bigger deal than it is maybe to us who's, who's, where it's felt a little bit more open comparatively. Um, so as we, as, we, as we again shift our, our, our look as to how did you travel as opposed to their perceptions, look at this, the, this five percentage. Almost half of them flew on their last trip. Most of them fly direct. Um, you know, you still have, you have a small percentage connecting, but that's a big uptick in terms of fly. So not only is, do they feel safer flying, they're actually doing it more often. And as Hammer just shows, the numbers are still down, so we're not up to where we were, but people are more willing to do so. 
And this is an interesting thing. We asked about safety at the airport, on the plane, and, and basically anything you do for driving. People feel a little bit safer of the people who did it. They feel safer on the plane and at the airport than they do while they drive. Again, more about their trip. This is always a big one for me. Now that you've taken this trip, about four out of five say, all right, I feel better about taking more trips. It's that first foray out the door, which, which, is, which makes a big deal. And then, uh, um, you know, when it comes to connections, you know, if there is a connection, you only have a very small percentage, about one in eight, who said they'll only take direct flights, which I know matters sometimes with, with your airport for getting those connections. So again, willingness to fly is up. And then finally, since we did this, like I said, right after Thanksgiving, we just checked in, you know, did you travel? Um, about one in five traveled for Thanksgiving, and about two in five had people come to them for Thanksgiving, which is kind of what I've seen compared to some national studies, um, but, it, but that, that, that really depends. Um, but again, these are all, with all these results, these are with your consumers. I think that's the important thing. We're targeting markets that have generally been popular for, for Fort Myers, Santa Bel Captiva. So that's a overview of the changes. As we've seen, as I said, there's more data in the packet, but I wanted to kind of focus on the changes and things that are different, especially as Tamara mentioned, that perception of flight moved a lot more this time than we have in any other wave. Any questions? Let's, yeah, let's open the floor for questions and go ahead and just ask them directly to uh, Joe. I noticed in, in an early slide you indicate that your cutoff age for the survey is 70. Um, seems a little young to me if the, a large percentage of our visitors are over 70. I, I mean, yeah, that, that's, just, that's just where we set it. That is something that we could change if we wanted to. The one thing about this, it's, a, it's an online survey, not that folks are over 70 will use online, but um, panels tend to be, tend to largely be within that age range for the most part. But that's something that we could, we could alter moving forward. It would, it would seem to make sense to me that it be older than 70. For sure. Quick question on slide eight. That's the one that says right now, do you feel safe doing anything, doing any of the following? 61% way back said, so in the first wave, 61% said no, but now we're, all, we're down to 20. Is that right? Like, yeah, I think more people are inclined to go do more things. Yes. I mean, ultimately, that, and I pulled this back up, you'll see that massive downward trend. At the very start, a lot of people were just like, no, none of these travel things, I'm not even doing them in my community. Now you at least have about 80% who are at least willing to do one of these things. Um, like I said, you do have a very small percentage who are still like, I'm not willing to do any of it. But yeah, that's a good point. People in general, especially over the last couple waves, are just more open to travel type experiences, even if it's only in their backyard. I think when you spoke before, you talked about the three buckets. Yeah. The, the, the first bucket, the not do anything, is just shrinking, right? Yes, exactly. And the other two are getting larger. Yeah, with, with the buckets, you have like the people who just won't travel, that's shrinking. They probably moved in this middle bucket, which tends to shift based upon the cases, which as cases have went up, that means they're probably less willing to travel. But they've at least moved into that, I'm okay with the idea of travel and, and, and traveling. So that's a good point, Tamara. And, and, you know, thinking back to your question, Rob, you know, the airport, I mean, we're still getting a ton of drives. Sure. You know, so it's not going to show up in those airport numbers yet. Uh, with the vaccine coming out, like, when do you think you would do your next wave? I'm just curious when that, how that will affect the feedback that you're getting. Like, are you going to do it? Like, do you have a time frame for the next time you would do a survey? We haven't finalized it, um, but I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Tamara. We, we've been doing them about every four to six weeks, yeah. you know, just kind of, you know, letting the water get tested. So probably after the first of the year, I mean, that would be when we would probably would do it. You know, we may know this week if the vaccine gets approved. Um, so uh, fingers crossed, I mean, you know, that we know this week. But, um, uh, you know, we probably we probably would wait until after the first of the year. Yeah, I mean, that, that is one thing we definitely, we'd re definitely recommend waiting to least after that Christmas, New Year's holiday, because then you can kind of get a sense of how people traveled there. And then maybe we wait a little bit. So it would probably be sometime in January where that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good? I mean, yeah. Because sure. it's a balance of people are traveling for the holidays and there's a higher incident of percent positive right. to there's strong news now with a vaccine coming out. So it, I'm not even sure the, how skewed these numbers would be because of both things happening at the same time. Right. right? Like I, it's going to be very interesting to see 
and traveling, as Joseph has indicated, makes most people more confident about traveling again. So the, the travel over the holiday may make them more interested in traveling again or more confident. Yeah, I mean, at least based upon their sentiment and what we've seen, that, that statement, it may not be true for everybody, of course, but for most people, once they do it once, they're like, okay, this isn't that bad. And some of the feedback we're hearing is that it may not have been worth the risk for Thanksgiving, which is typically, what, a three- to four-day weekend, but most people, you can take a whole lot more time off at Christmas, and then it's worth that time. You know, you might think differently because you could get seven to ten days out of a trip to come in and see, and see your family or do whatever it is. Four hundred fifty. Four hundred fifty at each wave. Um, I believe there was nine different markets, so fifty in each in, in each market, and we've that's been consistent. The one difference was um, in the first five wave, we changed the markets in um, wave six and seven to pick a couple, a, a handful more markets that are specifically to Fort Myers, because uh, before we were, we were doing it in conjunction with Sarasota, so we kind of tossed out a couple of theirs and added some more that are more Fort Myers, Sanibel, Captiva. And, and cold weather destinations. Yes, so that we exactly. were getting some of our typical winter market destination. That was our intent. Good point. I, uh, from the question we had earlier, which is kind of plays into the multiple waves, um, I would assume that you would need to keep your average age similar with each of these waves within that age range? Because I would assume if I asked a 70-year-old these questions and asked a 20-year-old these questions, I'd get vastly different answers. It, it, that, that becomes, anytime you're doing a study like this, if you're going to make changes, and it's a change, we had a conversation about it, we were changing the markets. That means the, the differences between waves you won't know is because the change that you made or is because of pursuit, consumer perception change. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes, does making the change and think that data is better, does that outweigh the ability to change to compare to other waves? And that we kind of take on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a good point. It's something we need, we need to consider when kind of thinking about the next wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it, it, it's worth a conversation yes. because especially coming up, our average age increases in the winter months. 70 has gotten younger. Oh, I, and I'm not bagging on 70. <laughs> no, and, and I, go ahead. Around, yeah, in or around there. Okay. <clears throat> That's kind of where we were thinking, early January. Okay. Any more questions for Joseph? Okay. All right, before I bring Brian up to give the, the uh, marketing update, I just want to share with you what's going on at the Bureau. Um, about a third of our team is still working on the Lee Cares program, and um, that will continue at least uh, through the end of this month. Um, probably a few of them will continue to work into the new year on that program. Our sales team has been very busy hosting uh, a lot of virtual events, in fact, um, uh, we have over 20 in this quarter alone that we're participating in. That's allowing them to stay in touch with their key clients and stay top of mind. Um, to call out a couple of things we've done recently on the sales side, um, Erin Congregain, who actually the next time you see her, because she was uh, married this weekend, her new name is Lester, Erin Lester, um, uh, hosted a virtual meeting planner fam targeting our Southeast Drive market, and we had 32 meeting planners participate in that. Really went off very well. And then um, additionally, we placed a, a, a custom content article with Sk uh, Event MB Skift, and uh, the article was titled, Nature Forward Destinations Change the Game with Open Air Meetings. So we're really trying to position ourselves um, as a an outdoor venue where meetings can still can still occur and that people can still gather so just want to make you aware of that and then on the public relations side um, we recently hosted a Hobie media event uh, 13 media on Matt Lachey and um, I will admit it was in the middle of the tropical storm that made it a little bit interesting but um, flexibility is the key to life at the VCB and we're good at that 
Um, this is our third co-hosted media event with Hobie, and this year they brought on board the American Fishing and Tackle Company as a co-sponsor of the event. And that was really great because they brought in flat boats in addition to the uh, Hobie kayaks. So we got a little bit different media that, that does the flat boats, so that'll broaden their experience and, of course, um, hopefully generate some additional coverage. We also uh, hosted the second annual Gift from the Sea Writers Conference at the Outrigger on Fort Myers Beach, uh, hosting four regional writers to uh, find inspiration like Anne-Marie Lindbergh did here. And uh, the latest version of the Shellcast podcast dropped Tuesday, and it features Everglades Wonder Gardens. And last but not least, um, Jackie Parker participated in a Visit Florida Media mission where um, we were able to connect with more than a dozen national journalists, including CNN, The Today Show, Martha Stewart Living, and Lonely Planet. And then my last thing is, I sent you an email a couple of days ago, but Judy is retiring. So I want to personally say my thank you for Judy for her nearly 25 years of service to uh, the Visitor and Convention Bureau, to Lee County, our citizens, the visitors through the airport. Judy is an amazing person. I, I have to admit it's a little bit bittersweet for me because um, I value her so very much, but I'm thrilled for her that she's going to get to uh, spend a little more time on her and a little less time on work. And uh, uh, so just, I know we can't, you're not supposed to touch and hug, but at least please give Judy a round of applause for her years of time. <laughs> special, special person, as those of you who know her well know, uh, we are gonna miss her. So Brian, I know it's hard to follow that up, sorry, um, but we get to it. <laughs> you should have given me a little heads up that I had to follow that. <laughs> Judy, you will be missed. Um, I'm Brian Ososki, Marketing Director for the Lee County Visitor and Convention Bureau to give you the marketing update this morning. Um, with today's update, we wanted to do something just a little bit different and uh, take a bit of a deeper dive into this fiscal year's media strategies. We're coming off the heels of a pretty successful virtual annual meeting, our Tourism Outlook event at the end of October, where I provided sort of some broad brush strokes of what this um, year looks like. But today, uh, I don't want to go too deep into the whole year. Really, it's um, what you guys are most interested in and what we have in market that's going to be uh, affecting winter season. Well, there's some creative sprinkled in here and there, but really, it's all about how we're approaching winter with our marketing tactics. So taking a fundamental approach, that's not changed. Everything is data-led, the decisions that we make. Um, we are constantly aligning and realigning with ongoing shifts in media consumption, the way consumers are getting their content. Uh, also important to us to remain extremely flexible because with all of the unknowns, uh, we, we need to be able to pivot quickly, much like we did after the early July spike. We're always optimizing our targeting, uh, again, to make sure we're reaching those intent-based consumers, people that are most likely to travel right now. Keeping a close look, uh, close watch on the evolution of, pub of the publisher landscape because they're always rolling out new opportunities, new technologies. Uh, media is evolving much like anything else and we want to be at the forefront of that. And then of course identi identify opportunities to uplift our industry partners. So uh, just to show you a little bit about our seasonality, how that changed from last year to this year. You can see there on the arrow and the, at the bottom of the screen Last year, our winter spend as a percentage to the overall budget was just under 15%. Uh, this year, that is sitting at 27%. Uh, we shifted some resources from summer and fall from, uh, to uh, uh, support the winter sort of ready, set phase of our recovery to make sure that the budget is there. And uh, this has even changed uh, since the sales and marketing plan was rolled out at the end of October. Um, feeling like booking windows are shrinking. It wasn't that long ago they were over 60 days. Now we're less than 45 days. So we wanted to make sure that we put our resources where they're um, needed and where they're going to have the biggest impact. When it comes to how we're spending uh, our money, you can see digital by far outweighs every other type of um, 
Media plan segment, just under 43%. Print and out of home are a bit lower to shift more resources to digital. And our broadcast allocations at 24% are still pretty good, um, but we found some cost savings there by shifting away from traditional broadcast placements and focusing on more on you know, programmatic digital placements, advanced TV, podcast, streaming audio, and that sort of thing. And I'll share a little bit more with you uh, on that here in just a little bit. So jumping right into media and starting with integrated packages. And just as a reminder, integrated packages are uh, how we refer to publishers or placements, I should say, that have a lot of different components. Uh, as an example, first up is, is, is Condé Nast. We're working on a national Back to the Beaches campaign uh, that features three new videos, a Pinterest promotion, some advertorial, and dedicated email. And so it's, um, it's a very robust campaign. Uh, now, just so you know, there are charts like this one throughout this entire presentation uh, that um, outline or do a summary of each of our placements and tactics. They're all in your packets. Uh, for the sake of time today, I won't spend a lot of time on these charts, but I did include them in the presentation in case you wanted to go back and, uh, and take a look. So, just a heads up, I'll be moving past the charts pretty quickly today. Next up is Meredith. Meredith publishes Travel and Leisure, Parents Magazine, Southern Living, and Midwest Living. Another great partner for us over the years. There's a lot that we're working on with Meredith, native content. Uh, as you can see, there, the, the spread of the tutorials. We are working on some onserts that are actually polybagged and go on the front of their magazines. Historically, we've put stuff inside the magazines and now we're going for it, going to be right up front. Um, our partnership with Meredith also features some good co-op integration for our partners. And there's the timing. And you'll see on these charts uh, a funnel phase. You know, we talk about a full funnel approach to our marketing efforts, everything from inspiration to conversion. And some of these, most of these, uh, check multiple boxes, even though you'll see that uh, we try to assign a funnel phase to each. For Southern Living, that will be uh, Florida and Georgia. Travel and Leisure is Florida, Georgia, and our fly markets. Parents Magazine, the same, and then Midwest Living is a national placement. The New York Times, um, we have a full season um, program with them. This represents a couple of great getaways emails that we're sending with them to all of their subscribers. One has already dropped this month. The next is scheduled for February. Uh, we're also looking forward to running some spots in the New York Times The Daily podcast. Uh, it has over 2 million downloads a day and is uh, one of the most popular on the planet. Smithsonian, we were the destination sponsor for the Smithsonian's annual photo contest last year for the travel uh, photos. And this is a great example of repurposing um, content. There at the end of last fiscal year, Smithsonian wasn't happy with the number of impressions we were getting, so we worked with their team and we carried this uh, article into the fall, into Q1 of this fiscal year. And I, I kept it in here because even though it's repurposed content, we do that a lot. We're able to uh, let our content run its course, take it down, and then you know several months can pass or what have you, we can turn it back on and all of a sudden it becomes new again. And so we do that a lot with some of these uh, these placements. Getting into broadcast, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what we're doing is shifting away from the traditional um, placements. Uh, leading here with advanced TV, we have a year-long effort. Uh, basically, advanced TV is cutting the cord. So we have a year-long effort with several publishers that you can see here, everyone from Amazon to uh, Experian to YouTube. Uh, we're showing this as affecting the prospecting phase on the chart here, as you can see there on the left. But given all of the uh, targeting tactics that come along with a digital placement like advanced TV, it really probably should be prospecting slash intent because we can really peop uh, hit people at multiple places in the funnel, multiple points in the funnel, um, giving the targeting tactics available to us. And we do take advantage of those. Moving to audio, again, use a lot, utilizing multiple formats to reach um, our consumers where and how they're listening um, post-COVID. This uh, gives us the ability through um, 
vendors like uh, Centro to uh, deploy in both English and Spanish, which is something we're doing this year. Um, it's year-long messaging, and um, we're in podcasts, and the cool thing about podcasts now is that we can uh, employ targeting tactics across a sea of podcasts that are available to us, including folks that have an affinity for travel right now. And then Pandora, we've had a multi-year relationship with them. It's streaming radio, again, that offers targeting for us. And we even have our own Know the Feeling branded station. Uh, and we just tweaked our song list just the other day. So good stuff with Pandora. Uh, NPR, our loyal listeners, um, to affect that in-state 250-mile drive market, uh, we have a robust NPR buy that started last month and is running through this month uh, for the holiday season. In the summary of audio there. Going into out of home, our digital out of home placements are part of our winter mix. It gives us some greater reach, especially in the cold, cold uh, uh, weather markets where we want to be. The technology around out of home is really, really cool. It allows us, we can geofence each of these places and then serve up ads on social media to anyone that was in a five mile radius of our digital out of home messaging. And the other thing is there's a, um, well, our vendor here is Mobile Fuse. Uh, there's a new partnership that they have with Arrivalist, which is one of our research, new research firms. This lets us know now that if someone was in the vicinity or exposed to one of our digital out of home boards, we can track them and know when they actually arrive in the destination. Kind of cool. Little big brother, but kind of cool. Um, I mentioned the cold weather markets. This, we are, we are finalizing the creative for the out of home um, placements on the digital boards now, so I didn't have that to share with you, but um, this will be uh, launching here in about a week, uh, making some final tweaks. Chicago, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Minneapolis and the summary for out of home. So digital, again, the largest part of our consumer plan segment. Um, it's a full funnel approach, a lot of moving pieces. The digital placements really, really do run the gamut or, and are uh, a part of our always on media strategy. The targeting is really precise and we can tailor messaging to each of those target audiences that you've uh, heard me talk about. Programmatic means we can target um, different sorts of consumers over literally hundreds of different websites and focus um, on the most relevant data segments to us. Uh, so anyway, we uh, use multiple vendors, multiple um, targeting tactics to reach folks uh, through digital ad placements. We are also all over the travel endemic sites. That means these sites are obviously specific to travel. TravelZoo, Expedia, Verbo, TripAdvisor. Um, it lets us again reach consumers with a full funnel approach from inspiration to conversion in the travel space. And again, several opportunities here for partner co-op integration. I left this chart in there. It's not necessarily tied to winter. I wanted you guys to know that we are um, targeting vaca the vacation rental market as we uh, mentioned earlier, we talked about earlier. This has gotten extremely popular, especially during the pandemic. Um, and this is a chart that shows some of the uh, partners and some of the tactics uh, that we are employing. Email, we work with uh, publishers like eTarget and Luxury Link that have these monstrous subscriber lists um, of people interested in all uh, types of different travel. And we, ex we, we deploy these emails throughout the year. We have one with eTarget uh, that deployed last month, another with Luxury Link deploying this month, and of course these are all, um, these all include co-op integration with our partners. In addition to the emails that we purchase sort of outside of the VCB, we have our own database of over 250,000 subscribers. We communicate to regularly through e-newsletters. E and then something new, vacation date emails, um, like the one you see here. Uh, we are able to identify our subscribers who have anticipated travel plans uh, within the next 30 days. And so we send them uh, uh, a different email about their vacation date with us. Cool. I could spend the entire time with you this morning talking about how robust our social program is. Just know there's a lot more time now because of COVID being spent on social media. 
We have a robust, always-on social media program, and the spend, how we invest in our social channels, is weighted based on the time that people spend on each platform. And you can imagine that Facebook and Instagram lead the way. Uh, we're able to uh, uh, initiate weather-triggered messaging, creative editorial drivers, videos, sweepstakes, all of those things, all the things, and uh, we'll continue to do that throughout this fiscal year. Doesn't mean we're not on Pinterest. You know, we take advantage of some trending topics on Pinterest, uh, Twitter for brand awareness, but really Facebook and Instagram uh, lead the way. Our social team also uh, manages our uh, influencer partnerships. Uh, we've had some recent success with um, Airstream, a partnership with uh, Matador, Airstream, and the Pickett family, uh, who've been traveling the country on their Beyond Land road trip. And you can see the uh, example social post there. This was only after two days. Uh, the IGT video from Airstream already had 5,400 views, which is really cool. Um, we do have a couple more influencer visitor, uh, visits coming up that are focused on road trips. Uh, here with Daniela Ramirez, uh, she's a mom and a lifestyle blogger based in state, so it's realistic that she and her family could take a trip from Miami into, uh, into Lee County. And then uh, Mama Mandy, she's just north of us in, um, in Bradenton, and she'll be visiting uh, the destination in March. So I wrestled with including paid search in this deck today. I'm coming to the end of, of, of my presentation, but you know, it's, it's not as sexy, sort of, as some of the other uh, efforts that we, that we employ, but we do make a huge investment in keywords, and we continue to keywords that are going to help people uh, find our destination in Google. Um, I'm showing this because Google has a new discovery campaign that we're um, uh, participating in. Now we can advertise in Google without someone making a query. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a query-based ad that we serve up. Machine learning allows us to submit multiple pieces of creative and deliver the result or the creative that best um, uh, engages with the consumer to the individual who is searching. So as with any technology platform, Google is no different. They're trying to take over the world and we're trying to tap into all the opportunities available to us because of course we want to take over the world too. Cool stuff. Um, so there is a full digital summary that you guys can take a look at in your uh, packets. Lastly today is um, on the consumer website. We've engaged with a company called Banwango uh, that has helped us create a digital savings pass, an experience passport. Think of this as those uh, printed coupon books that people used to have and carry around for restaurants, attractions, and activities. It's mobile first, digital approach, it's free, it's easy to download, and it's good for both visitors and locals. And this launched November 16th. So what is that, roughly three weeks? We've already had just under 1,500 downloads, several countries outside the US. You could see there Canada, Germany, and UK, we would expect, but Austria, Spain, the Netherlands, and uh, I pulled one other country off here uh, that had one download from Uganda. Uh, on the domestic side, we've had over 800 downloads from Florida, plus uh, states like Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, New York, and the like. So that was a lot in a short amount of time. But I know that, again, peak season is coming up. It's make or break time for a lot of our partners. And Tam and I felt like, yeah, we touched on a lot of these things high level at the Tourism Outlook event, but we wanted to do a bit of a deeper dive and say, hey, we've moved our resources. We're taking advantage of all the various marketing channels that are out there. And uh, we are focusing on all phases of the, of the marketing funnel, driving bookings. I didn't even mention, didn't even mention group and weddings, and all of those things that we're doing. This was strictly leisure, consumer focused, but know that we are working very closely with the sales team as well on all of their initiatives. So happy to answer any questions that you guys might have this morning. Now that was a lot. Rob. Are you finding that, uh, that you can buy more ads um, 
in today's world or are your cost out there with our partners every bit what they were pre-pandemic? Um, some of the larger publishers haven't really wanted to come off of their rate card when it comes to uh, things, big, big packages, but here's, here's, here's what we do. We negotiate at the beginning of the year for the entire time, and so when uh, publishers can get that kind of business on their books for that length of time, the price comes down. Also, uh, even if the package itself doesn't cost a whole heck of a lot less, we're, getting, we're negotiating for added value, and that's one of the metrics that uh, MMGY is presently measured against, and I usually am photogenic uh, with, I mean, uh, can pull it right up the numbers, but I think it was over $3 million ending FY20 with added value um, above and beyond our spend. And so that's how we approach it. We want more for the money. May not be less money overall, but we're getting more for what we're spending. And I would say, Brian, a lot of the publishers have been really generous about that added value, right? I think yes. we're seeing that, you know, they're really happy that we're still making our placements and they're adding some, you know, additional impressions and other things to it, at least from the conversations I've had with them. And you, you're doing that more intimately than I am, but. For sure, and you know, uh, we've gone with, you know, we're always testing evolving media, but we've gone this year with more tried and true publishers have sort of been in the trenches with us. It also allows for that flexibility that I talked about, allows us to pivot. The last thing we want to do is pause a campaign, change the content, do all those sorts of things, but you know, we've already had to do that this year and we are prepared to do it again and we feel like the publishers that we're working with as part of this plan offer that as well to us. And, and I think, you know, it's important to add to that just a little bit, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we choose an agency of record that has this large travel client database is because they're not just coming in and buying the VCB's ad, they're buying, you know, for choice hotels and, you know, a, a whole bunch of other people. And when they come into the table to negotiate, the, the rate card goes away and then, you know, the, the, the more favorable rates come out, right? And I think that really makes a big difference. So what we negotiate at our rate is a much higher buy to begin with because, because MMGY has that capacity at the table and not just MMGY, but any agency that has a lot of clients that are buying in that placement is going to have that kind of leverage. We required our agency, I, I, I think, to have a minimum of $40 million in annual billing. We, want to be, we don't want to be the big fish in a small, in a, in a small pond when it comes to media. We want to be part of a much larger pool, as Tam mentioned, that um, allows them to leverage those costs down on our behalf. Some of these things, Rob, that we do don't even have rate card tied to them. Sometimes it's just brainstorming coming up with something new, which we always like to do, something custom for us. Anything Other questions else? for Brian? All right. One last thing. I had an email from um, Alex Cass at the Carousel Inn Beach, uh, on Fort Myers Beach, Carousel Inn, excuse me. And um, he mentioned that he's seeing a lot of um, scam booking emails where they're reaching out, um, uh, asking to prepay for like the most expensive room for a long stay. And um, they're using a stolen credit card and then they come back later and indicate that they're the victim of their having their credit card stolen ask for a credit and they put it on a different credit card. So um, just sharing, he said, would you please share with the industry? And I know most of you are pretty seasoned and you know how this works, but um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, it is the, the heightened time of um, email scam season. So um, just be careful. So. That's all I have. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, and of course, Thank you, Judy. Well, thank you very much, Tamara, too. And uh, it's, uh, that was a wonderful presentation. It's good to see how our visitors feel who are visiting and looking at visiting, and then also to see the uh, marketing efforts that we're undertaking to capture those who are actively looking to you know, visit the area right now. If there are people out there who are comfortable enough and ready to travel, then we want them to think about our destination and supporting our local businesses. So thank and, you. And just to add, in your packet in the back are, are the full slides from Joseph. And, and we distributed those to you in your email too. But if anybody's interested, we'll, we'll give you the, the full, full deck from Joseph. He just presented highlights. 
Good deal. That's a good resource for everyone. Okay. Well, let's move to the new business portion of the agenda today. Uh, the first item under new business is the appointment of the TDC vice chair. Uh, I believe our current vice chair is Mr. Wells. And yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. No, I thought we, we had a different vice chair last year. Did we make it Tony last year? That's what I thought I remembered too. No, he's not here. Good. <laughs> he's not here, huh? <laughs> so I will at this time open the floor for nominations of a vice chair and I recognize Fran. I would make a motion. Rob has done such a wonderful job that he continued to do that job if he would. Second. All right. So the nomination is for Mr. Wells, and the second uh, is from Fran Myers, and the second is from Pam Cronin. Do we have any discussion on that item? No? Do we see any objections? No objections? Then that motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Yay, Rob. Thank you. All right, the uh, next item is uh, we're going to approve the 2021 TDC meeting dates. Now that we've got such an able vice chair, I'm going to skip the meetings for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, but I, I think everybody got a chance to review the uh, calendar dates. Does anybody have any conflicts with what's been, uh, or any discussion on with what's been proposed? Uh, Colleen, go ahead. To clarify, I guess I didn't see that, that the three of these meetings begin at two? Yeah, and, and I'll be right up front. That's my fault. I am, uh, I am booked to be chairman of the TDC, but also uh, the county's representative on the West Coast Inland Navigation District's um, uh, board. And so I have to be at Venice th those mornings on that board and then here in the afternoon on this board. And so if y'all, if that works for you all, I, I'd love to be able to do that. Okay. So just those three, though. Yeah, it was just the, the April, um, June, June, and August. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Thank you. All right. Very good. Any further questions then? It, it'll, it'll keep you fresh, right? What, which day do I come and which time do I come? <laughs> but we'll, we will send some friendly reminders, of course. <laughs> Thank you guys for that flexibility. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'll open up the floor at this point to a motion. Does anybody wish to make a motion to accept the meeting schedule for 2021? Make a motion. The motion's made by Fran Myers and the second's from Councilman McLean. Do we have any further discussion on the item? Do we have any objections? No objections. That passes unanimously. Thanks, folks. All right, and we'll move on to item number C, which is a presentation from Jesse Lavender in Parks and Recreation on the Lynn Hall Restrooms Remodel Project and a beach, beach Renourishment Update. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, morning. Council. Um, I'm here before you today to do two things. One, ask for a request of funding for uh, a restroom remodel project, which we had pre previously approved for a, a lesser amount. And number two, to update you on a uh, beach nourishment that is going to take place at Lynn Hall Park uh, beginning this Saturday, actually. So I want you to take note of this photo. This photo was taken uh, the day after Tropical Storm Ada came through. Um, as you can see, the dune system that was recently put into place during the dune walkover project that you graciously approved um, held up, but it leaves us you know, uh, quite a bit of escarpment. Um, we have some uh, landscaping uh, irrigation lines that are exposed. Um, and there are several other safety concerns, which is why we rushed and uh, worked with Natural Resources and Steve Boutel to get uh, this remedied as soon as possible. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is the restroom remodel project. Um, if you're not aware with the FEMA regulations on building in coastal areas, um, they will only allow you to improve 50% of the value of each structure. So uh, we were fortunate, I don't like delays, but this project was delayed. We had selected a contractor to do the construction of the remodel. They backed out, we had to go back out and select a different contractor. And during that time, the value of the restroom building increased, which gives us the opportunity to get the last thing that we wanted to do at the restrooms uh, done, which is insulate the roof. Um, this will make the structure more comfortable. Um, the, the temperature will remain 
fairly consistent if we insulate, um, and that becomes that that comes at a cost of an extra seventy-five thousand um, dollars. And again, should you approve this, the uh, uh, GMP is scheduled to go before the Board of County Commissioners in February, and the project is uh, scheduled to begin in mid-March. Uh, just to give you an idea of the funding, um, the previous request and approved uh, uh, price of $375,000. If we add this extra $75,000, it would bring the total of this project to $450,000. Um, now to go on to the beach renourishment update, um, as I mentioned, Tropical Storm Ada had pretty significant impact on the dune system at Lynn Hall Park, which is 600 linear, linear feet. Uh, we estimated that 6,000 tons were removed. Um, we are conducting a emergency purchase order of $200,000 from the Beach Renourishment Trust Funds. And when this PowerPoint was done, we, were, we didn't really know exactly when the project was gonna start, but um, it's scheduled to begin um, um, Saturday. They're gonna set up Saturday and Sunday, and then Monday, uh, the trucks will start coming in from the pit. Um, we anticipate about 300 trucks uh, throughout the week next week. Um, the impacts of the park during this renourishment, the northern half of the parking lot will be closed and the beach will be closed uh, from the pier to the northern end of the park boundary. And again, that is for safety reasons. Um, the contractor is trying to work things out to where, you know, so people can walk by, but just being very cautious uh, with the amount of machinery and things going on the beach, I, you know, in the press release and things like that, we're, we're encouraging people not to walk on the beach between the pier and the northern end of, of the park boundary. Um, again, the funding uh, coming from the uh, Beach Renourishment Trust Funds is down here at the bottom. We have 4.7 in there now. Less than 200,000, we will have 4.5 million in the emergency beach trust funds. And I'm here for any questions you may have. So 300 trucks over the next week and then will the project, the, the total project last a week then? The project is uh, per contract supposed to be done by the 24th of December. Um, we anticipate that being sooner, but um, just for informational purposes, we're, we're going with the 24th of December. Okay, excellent. And um, on the previous project, the uh, remodel of the bathrooms, um, in my briefing we talked about where the 75,000 would come from. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yes, that would come from um, TDT Common Reserves. Um, it's, it's, this is a, a project that we've been really trying to get done. I feel it's, it's, we're at a point to be able to get that last amenity added to the restrooms during the construction and not have to come in and insulate this later on. Uh, it'd be better to get it all done in one fail swoop, uh, which is why we're requesting the funds uh, from the TDT Common Reserves. Okay, did you have any extra money left over from that Matanzas Pass project that you were thinking? Yes, sir, yes, yeah. sir. I wasn't sure if uh, we wanted to go into that, but I do have that information available. Uh, we did not spend, um, between the two projects, the dune walkovers and the Matanzas boardwalk, we have $74,500 unspent that would be going back into the TDT common reserves. Um, and that's, you know, $500 less than the yeah. 75000 so. Good. I, I wanted to point that out so that people understood. Yeah, you, you, you did great with your budget management on the other project. We're putting that back into the reserves, and, and then this is what we're hoping to use it for to help make sure that those, those bathrooms come out. I mean, that, that is one of the key features that many of our tourists see, right, when they come uh, arrive on Fort Myers Beach. And, and, and one of the biggest tourist attractions that we have is that pier and of course while you're at the pier you know you, you use the restroom you're there you know so we want it to be uh, in good shape so I, I thank you for coming up with the project Fran do you have a question I do Jesse um where are those trucks are the trucks going to be coming over the big bridge or from the south end or 
Uh, Steve, the big bridge? Yep, that's what I figured, the big bridge. Mm -hmm. And it'll be a week with the 300 trucks? Yes, yeah, so what they're, to kind of get into more detail of what they're doing, they're putting a conveyor belt at the, on the northern end of the, the parking lot. So rather than have a bunch of machinery going over our brand new dune walkovers, there will be a conveyor belt from the parking lot to the beach. The trucks will dump, the sand will go on the conveyor belt and be shipped out to the beach where the heavy machinery will spread it out. Okay. Good deal. Mr. Wells, yeah. Uh, great timing on the renourishment. Sort of, I'm sure the Fort Myers Beach residents appreciate it happening during a slow time of the year. Uh, I guess on the other hand, the, the, the restroom facilities, uh, and, and may, you might have mentioned this, what are you going to do when you're working on them in peak season? Well, there will be ample um, restroom trailers brought in um, to offset the closure uh, to the restroom facility for the work. Great. And you're looking for a motion to move forward? Yes, sir. I, I'd, I'd make that motion. And I don't know if motion to move forward is a good motion or not, but a motion to move forward with the uh, restoration project pro project at Lynn Hall um, Park. So the, the motion is from uh, Mr. Wells and the second is from Councilwoman Hossifras. Uh, and, and the motion is for approval of the staff's recommendation as proposed by staff uh, for, for these two projects. And I think that's a great motion too. I'll, I'll be very supportive of that. Do we have any further discussion on it though? Any questions? Just uh, why are you doing the sand work at a renourishment project starting on a Saturday? It seems like there might be a conflict. I know you want to get it done as quickly as possible, but Saturdays, Sundays are a busy time at the beach. You got 300 trucks coming in. Uh, is, um, is it also more expensive to do it on the weekend with the, the carriers? It's not more expensive. Um, we were just fortunate to get it scheduled as soon as possible, and that's really why we're starting this Saturday. Um, I realize no time is a good time for this park, um, for any type of closure, but uh, the goal at the staff level was to get this done as soon as possible, just in case we get hit with another cold front that's bringing, you know, some uh, high, stronger winds, stronger waves, things like that, yeah. And we do have another lovely park just down the street called Crescent Beach Family Park. And at the other end, too. Yes. <laughs> Is this the first time we've ever had truck sand on Fort Myers Beach? Uh, no, it's not. If you recall, we did a emergency beach renourishment at Crescent Beach. Okay. Um, I believe it was after another tropical storm. Irma. Irma, sorry. Okay. Irma. How can we forget? Um, but that Crescent has a seawall, and that was undermining the seawall, which is why we did that uh, renourishment. Very good. All right, seeing no further questions then, I'll go ahead and call for a vote. Do we have any opposition to the motion? All right, seeing none, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, and thank you for the great presentation too. All right, at this time we will move to four council information. Tamara, any? You have a full packet from me. <laughs> <laughs> Holiday reading maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I shared several things with you. Uh, some, some good information from a bunch of sources. So if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. But hopefully you find that interesting. Very good. All right. And uh, I have an item. Tamara doesn't know I'm going to do this, but for full council information. Um, so Tamara mentioned uh, the events earlier uh, with the riders and the Hobie uh, rep on Matt Lachey. Um, well, we, we got an email that I just wanted to share with all of you to talk about just how wonderful our team is here at the Visitor and Convention Bureau. Uh, and, and also, I'll just read it because it explains it very well. The email says, Commissioner Hammond, I've been fortunate to call Matt Lachey home since 1991. I founded a small kayak business there and have been working with the VCB for at least 25 years. As the Hobie sales rep in Florida for the past 13 years, I've been part of 10 plus events from photo shoots, writers events, and of course the Hobie Worlds on Captiva. Lee VCB understands and knows how to host events. I wanted you to know how much value that the VCB adds and helps with staging these events. The key people I work with have been Shelley Krant and Francesca Donlin. They make my life doing the logistics of bringing people to Lee County so much easier. 
We are all fortunate to have Tamara spearheading the VCB operation. She is a joy to be around, and her genuine concern about the experience that visitors have while visiting shows and her conversations. We just finished a riders event in Matt Lachey, and we got Tropical Storm Ada, who visited us during that week. Well, everyone scrambled to adapt, and we finished a great week with people from all over the United States. Thank you for your work with the TDC, and know that the VCB are the best in the industry. And that's from Frank Stapleton uh, out on Matt Lachey. So thank you for your hard work and scrambling and adapting. And Tropical Storm Ada really caught everybody kind of by surprise, even you know with schools and everything that day. So thank you for making that. Thank work. you for that. I, I'm embarrassed a little bit. Those are kind words, but you know, really, uh, as I said, we we scrambled. And honestly, I had dinner with them out there one night, and I, I wanted to hear how it was going, given that they had been. You know, a little discombobbled with with the weather events, and many of them had never been to Matt Lachey, and they were in love with Matt Lachey, as you can guess, as fishermen, and you know the the, the uh, as I say, preciousness of Matt Lachey. I think it's just adorable, and uh, they had a really good time, and I enjoyed talking to them. But those are really kind words. I'll have to pay Frank later, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, of course. But I had no idea. <laughs> You know, and to, to your entire team, I mean, this has all been a year where everybody's doing something completely different, you know, and to see that we can still, you know, hunker down, get to our core functions, make sure that people uh, uh, enjoy their time visiting here and that events that we, uh, that we can pull off in this day and age go off well, even with tropical storms. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, it's 2020, and I, I think we're going to get some snow down here this year. That would be about the only thing we haven't received. <laughs> Uh, in 2020, so maybe that'll be a first. No, uh, but thank you for what you and, guys do. And, and again, to the team that uh, handled that event, they, they were great. Francesca, Shelley Crant has been a fabulous contractor for us for many years, that does a great job, and we're grateful to them. Very good. Total team effort. Thank you, guys. Well, uh, let's move on to T TDC member items. Uh, does anybody have any member items they wish to share? Let's start with Fran. Um, I'd, I'd just really like to give a shout out to Judy out at the airport. I can't imagine the airport out there without without Judy. Um, her people out there, her volunteers, they love her. Mm -hmm. And I've spoke to so many over the years at the luncheon, and that's one of the reasons they're out there, because of Judy. So thank you, Judy, for all those years. You are a gem. Thank you. I'm pretty sure the airport loves her too, right? They do. <laughs> Ms. Cronin, anything? I don't have anything except Merry Christmas to everyone and Happy New Year, and I hope it's wonderful and good riddance to 2020. <laughs> hope you guys are doing well in the in the Christmas shop in the Shell Factory yeah. out there right now. Absolutely, yes, we've got Santa on Sunday. We've got breakfast with Santa. Yeah, so we're very excited about that. Totally sold out and well distanced, and we have one seat at each table for Santa, so he can go around and see the kids and everything instead of. They can't sit on his lap, but they can at least <laughs> chat with him. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you guys are making the most of it. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see if we can get the kids over there. Uh, Councilman McLean, anything? I just wish everybody a, a, a happy holiday season and a safe one, and, and uh, goodbye to 2020 as soon as possible. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. How about Councilwoman Hassefrost? Just happy holidays to everybody, and take care of yourselves. Yeah, very good. All right, Colleen? Well, before I wish you all happy holiday, I, um, I'm part of the Southwest Florida Alliance of Chambers, and we did calls last week with the elected officials. Some of them, most of them are actually freshmen. It's for Lee County. It was very disturbing was, was that Florida funding came up as conversation. This is going to be a tough budget year, obviously, because the tax, you know, what was um, tax base earned in, in, in regards to um, the state has obviously got a huge shortfall and we have to operate at a flat budget. So there was kind of like, though it has been reauthorized, which was our concern last year, there is talk about their budget being cut even further. I know that there's some tough decisions to be made in Tallahassee this year. So as I hear more, I'm, I'm kind of gathering information on that, but that was incredibly disappointing to hear that they would that that, that that, you know, organizations already had a 50 million, though 50 million sounds like a lot of money, but not for what they do. So we've been speaking to some of them, uh, the elected officials individually, John Lai and I spoke to one yesterday, like we are not, we are doing our homework on this, but I may share something with Tam and ask to share with you. In the past, we have 
um, done a declaration and, and went to the Board of County Commissioners that we support Visit Florida and the reauthorization and the funding. We really can't have that organization have any less money than it currently does to do the job we need to do. Because otherwise, 2022, which we hope would be very successful, could be a challenge if we don't keep um, working with Visit Florida. So um, put a damper on our little, I'm sorry. And, and Judy, you know I love you. So, but I just wanted to share this note that I will share with you as we hear more. If you share, if you hear anything, please let us know because we are actively working on that. Um, some, some of the hoteliers and some of the chambers. So with that being said, if you have any questions, let me know. And I do wish all of you a happy new year and a safe holiday. Thank you very much for the time. Good information. Thanks for helping get that on our radar. You know, uh, Rob, anything you want to add? Happy holiday season to everybody. Yeah, and Mr. Kramer. Uh, Judy, thank you for everything that you've done for the county and for all of us here at this table. We appreciate it. Um, I also just want to mention that the Florida Restaurant Lodging Association had an um, online auction that we did called Love Local, where we got a bunch of our local hospitality businesses to donate, and we put all these great uh, items up for bid online, and we raised a little over $13,000, which is going to go towards uh, the Florida this area's uh, high school pro start uh, culinary programs for the students for supplies and equipment and things like that. So thank you for everybody's support of that and, and for buying the great gifts. And uh, it was a nice successful little venture that we had. And happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Yep. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy New Year to everybody here. This is a uh, I, I tell you what, the best present I've gotten, I got it early. I get to serve as TDC chairman for one more year here. So I, I, I really look forward to working with all of you again over the next year. And um, we'll do what we can to make this a great year for tourism. I promise you that. Uh, all right, if there's nothing else for the good of the order, then we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. It was cool. I left my jacket on. Enjoy it. <clears throat> Now, unfortunately, um, our, our resorts in Hawaii are closing back down again. And uh, residents of CEO of So I'll be working on it.